And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest and craziest means possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer here to the temple, creator of Soul, Fi creator of Soul Finder, both, de both Demons Match and Black Tide. And a, and a and a man of of men, of many time zones coming fresh off of it off of arguably his first con since the coof, the one and only Douglas Ernst. How are you doing today, man? Hey, thanks for the invite. I really appreciate it. Thank thank you for coming on, and thank you for um de thank you for dealing with times with time zone roulette. Yeah, I know how that goes. So ha ha just happy to be here, man. Mm -hmm. So. I'd like to I'd like to open with the humble beginnings in a sense. Um, first off, first off, what got what got you into comics at an at an earlier later age? Some people some people are late bloomers on this kind of thing. Sure. So when I was a little kid, uh, very little uh, before I could even read, uh, I had two older brothers that were both in the comic books, and my oldest brother was a big fan of Spider-Man and Iron Man. Mm -hmm. And we had this ugly greenish yellowish disgusting chair uh, in the early eighties. And uh, he would basically bring me onto the chair on his lap or whatever, sometimes the arm of the chair. And he would just read Spider-Man and Iron Man comics to me. And so I literally learned how to read on Spider-Man comic books. And I've been reading Spider-Man ever since. Mm -hmm. So with would you? I realize this is I realize this is a question that um is not holding up with age these days. But in those early days, would you consider yourself more of a Marvel guy than a DC guy? Yeah, when I was growing up, you at some point in time you were either just Marvel or DC. Like you weren't really both. I don't know. Like it, as I got older, I was like, that's kind of irrational and weird. Uh, but. When I was growing up, yeah, it was only Marvel. I mean, part of it is also because you only have so much allowance money. So if we mowed the lawn and took out garbage and dusted my grandmother's room or whatever, like you might get a couple bucks. And so you only had limited funds. So I would just always buy Spider-Man and Iron Man. And then uh, my other brother would buy Daredevil and X-Men. My oldest brother, he had more money, so he would also in addition to iron man and spider-man he would get stuff like captain america uh he he would get like um gi joe uh things like that and then so we would all sort of read each other's comic books mm -hmm. now with now um with that in mind um where where did the spark to write to write something like soul finder um come about walk me through that experience so Soul Finder was sort of born out of my distaste for modern comics, uh, particularly the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And what I see as just moral relativism, just entrenched in the industry, the stories that they don't even have anti-heroes. A lot of times these days, they're just kind of bad people that sometimes stumble upon doing good things or just happen to do good things. So I wanted to write a story that was just straight up good no mistaking it versus evil. And so that's, I was like, okay, well, demons are just, you can't really get any more evil than a demon. So, uh, so I have my bad guys. Are they going to be demons? And then I didn't like the way that uh, modern Marvel uh, and others, anytime there's like a, they shy away from religion in general, particularly mm -hmm. Christianity. And then half the time, if they ever do it, if they do like Catholicism, they get basic stuff wrong. So they'll, they'll hire somebody um, like a Muslim to write uh, Miss Marvel. And they're like obsessed with that. But then when it comes to a Daredevil book, uh, they can't get basic Catholicism right for some bizarre. Like they have Google, but they still can't get the basics right. So they usually make the, the priest or whoever is a mustache twirling villain or they just totally like warp the faith. So I was like, OK, well. Uh, I'll actually have exorcists who are good men and they're actually Catholics because a lot of times the exor quote unquote exorcists are not even Catholic. They're just sort of like people that are into the occult, which that's a, that's another 
topic in and of itself. Like they're they wouldn't even be ex exercising demons. <laughs> they would just be making the problem worse. Um, but so I was like, okay, I'll have actually Catholic priests, and uh, then I will have it be a level of evil that's beyond most what most people can fathom. And you will actually need to be a combat veteran in order to take on this level of evil because you'll need the physical prowess and you might run into situations where you, you need military training as well. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> it is, it is interesting. It is interesting that you bring, you bring that, you bring that kind of thing up when it comes, when it comes to, when it comes to that obsession of go, of going with, going with anti heroes who just happen to be, happen to be villains. Do you, do you suppose that do you suppose that's due to that's the consequence of to of, of writers not knowing how to write heroes or too much um too much deconstruction because I've I can I've heard it I've heard it multiple ways over the years. Yeah, I think there are multiple things going on so there are cultural changes that are happening in terms of what people are interested in even just the ed, the level of education that people have whether they're intellectually curious or not, I think they are not intellectually curious. So they're, they're not actually very, <laughs> there's not very many Renaissance men these days. We'll just put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, they grew up on John Stewart and Colbert, and that's about the extent of their, their, their knowledge. So there's that. Uh, but then also there's the deconstruction, like, like you said. And then at some point in time, I just think, <sighs> people decided that every superhero sort of needed to be like Deadpool for some reason. And they just keep writing different derivatives of Deadpool for, I, I don't even know why, but it, it's just like, yeah, we just want this sarcastic guy who just says whatever. And uh, they just apply it to everybody because they want to be Deadpool. I don't even know why it's, it's weird. Um, it's interesting that you bring, that you bring the, everybody wanting to be dead, wanting to be Deadpool. Um, since in since in since I'd say I'd get the feeling that these they they'd be the same people who um would look at lo, would look at Lobo in DC unironically, um, ignore, ignoring the fact that he's supposed to be a ridiculous parody of the ex, of some of the excesses of '90s comics. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's just one of those things where over the years I just found myself. <laughs> I even did a video on this on YouTube. When you when you when you compare eighties writers to modern writers, they're worlds apart. There's so much even writers that just were not really that well known or they're just not known to be like the the guys. Um it you can tell that the education system that they went through they were exposed to Shakespeare, <laughs> you know, like they were exposed to the best and brightest that had ever put the pen to the page or the ink to the page or whatever. And these modern writers, I, I feel like they don't really even read anything. Maybe they just listen to cable news and maybe they just go to their Twitter feed and see what their friends say. And then they just write stories based on what their friends say on Twitter. They don't, <laughs> they don't actually read stories. They don't care about the craft of storytelling and so as a result, you just get these sort of very shallow stories that they, mm -hmm. they don't they don't care about the transcendent. And so as a result, you get these sort of mundane, boring stories where it's like superheroes in a Seinfeld episode, but it's not written to the level of Seinfeld. No, although um. Although I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody, if some hack tried to tried to force in a laugh track into their comics. I don't know how right. you do. I don't know how <laughs> you do that, and I wouldn't advise doing it. But I'm saying it's just dumb enough that some that somebody would try that somebody would try. Um, but I don't. I'd I'd also I'd also argue that the the culture in the the culture in the big two is an, is is an is an incarnation of of the old adage. The head that rises above gets is the first to get chopped off. Mm -hmm. um, where because because of how click because of how clickish and gossip girl so many pe so many people over the over in those companies are, if anybody ends up doing and and anybody ends up being successful, um, 
the the others would tr the others would try and undermine that because they because they want that success but they don't have the ability to do it. Yeah, I think that's prob probably fair. Um, and, and you just have this sort of gaggle <laughs> of uh, mediocre creators. They they would rather just everybody be mediocre or bad than compete and then have the best guys sort of rise to the top. Mm -hmm. Um. But the thing, from my from my perspective, um, the thing is, ta talent will 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 always find will always find a way regardless, and that's that's why when um, I remember I remember year, years before years before a lot of um, people started doing crowdfunding, I had said that you're gonna see a lot of people you're gonna see a lot of people advertise as as X Marvel or X DC working on their own things. Mm. <clears throat> And um, well, my name is Mildred, not Nostradamus, but maybe it sh but maybe it should be, because <laughs> I'd because I'd say I'd say I more or less called that because people who people who have that level of talent, even if even if you try and even if you try and run them out or undermine them, they're gonna they're not going to just stop. The writing right. bug the writing bug is going to get in there, and once it gets in, you can't get it out. <clears throat> Yeah, if your vocation is you're a writer, you're going to write. I've always said I don't care where I am. I don't care. You could put me in any job as, as long as at the end of the day, if I could just write my blog for free, or, or as long as I'm writing, I'm going to be happy. And so, it doesn't bother me that the, the people that work at Marvel and DC, uh, they would never hire me uh, because we definitely, particularly over ideological reasons, unfortunately these days. But it's like I don't care. I know I'm going to write, and I and I I knew that I would ultimately find people that shared my values and shared. I don't know my sense of urgency in terms of wanting to tell really good stories to people, mm -hmm. and so you're going to find those artists, and eventually you'll you'll come together on a project that you could all be proud of. Yeah. Now, getting back getting back to Soulfinder, um, I've discussed with other creators a kind of chicken and egg um c um scenario, where some people they they end up they end up creating character concepts first. And then building the world around them, and some people um, do the opposite. They build a world and then, and then, and then fill that with the characters. Um, where on that particular paradigm would you say you fell in the um, planning phases of the comic? So uh, Father Patrick Redder was the my first creation, and so it definitely started with the characters first before the world building. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and then it was also one of those situations where the right, which, you know, cliche comes into effect, but mm -hmm. it's a cliche for a reason. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a practicing Catholic and I'm a veteran at the same time. So I was like, okay, well, I'm a writer by vocation and I, and I could incorporate all of these other things. And I also know a lot of veterans who have been to Afghanistan, Iraq and, and all of that. And, Obviously, I know a lot of practicing Catholics, Timothy Lim being one of them. And so that way, that'll give me a fighting chance. The last thing I wanted to do was write some story about, I don't know, an electrical engineer or something that becomes a superhero. I, I don't even know when I don't know anything about electrical engineering. And so I didn't want to give myself a more of a heavy creative lift than necessary. Like I'm always going to be doing research anyway, but it's just one of those things where it's like, okay, for my first outing, when I'm going first out the gate, I don't want to be taking on more, more than I can handle or biting off more than I can chew. And so having a, a Catholic priest who also happens to be a, a combat veteran was in my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. Now <clears throat> with, with that, with that kind of thing in mind, I do remember in the back end of the, of the first book, there was there was mentioning about a lot of um, a lot of trial and error when it came to when it came to getting the character design right. Was was that a was that a case of just a lot of the early, of having an idea but not nailing but having but having difficulty nailing down how fa the father was supposed to look. Some of it was so I did have 
um, a general idea of what I wanted. Let me see what Tim says here. He says, well, I want to go to like, I don't want to get anything wrong here. So what I wanted to do was also have Tim invested creatively in, in the book. So I had my own ideas of about Father Redder and what he might look like. So I don't think it says here... Uh, was it Scott Eastwood? That's Clint Eastwood's son. Mm-hmm. Um, that was what I don't think Tim mentions that. So that was like a general sort of look. I was like, he has to be a handsome guy. Um, I don't want my hero to be like an ugly dude. So he has to be pretty handsome. He has to look like something where, okay, okay, he's got these like natural good looks to him or whatever. So I think I told Tim that. And then I'm not sure if I gave him like another sort of, um, you know, Hollywood esque sort of actor to like meld them together. Uh, but I was like, but I'm definitely open to whatever you as the artist feel after having read this script, because I want you to be excited about the book because if Tim's inspired, if Tim's ex- excited, then it's going to go a lot better than if he's just, fo- you know, following orders like, okay, Doug says he's got to look this way. So it was just one of these things where it's like, okay, I knew Tim was a talented dude and I know where, where my instinct is uh, and let's just see what he comes up with and then we could find a principled compromise if there's any sort of differences. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and with now with that in, with that in mind, um, given the, given the fact that, this is a comic with a very with a very supernatural bent. I mean, we're deal we are dealing with exorcists. Um, what were what were some of the things that you drew upon when it came to when it came to that? Uh, sorry, I was still reading Timothy Lim. So, what were some of the things that I drew upon in terms of exorcists? Was that the question? Yeah, when it came when it came to exorcists and when it came to this being a very a very supernaturally leaning um, book. Um, there was actually a lot of research that went into this because I wanted everything to be theologically sound. I didn't want a priest or a deacon to read the book and say like, this is, this is not, you know, you got everything all wrong. So there was a lot of books that I read on exorcisms. And then I ran it by Tim, uh, Mike McNulty, who he, he's done stuff with Spider-Man Crawl Space in the past. He works for Bam Smack Pow. I think he still does. Um, he's also a practicing Catholic. I ran it by him. And then ultimately, um, some priests actually read it as well and got back to me. And they were pretty happy with where everything was at as well. So I, at least I did enough research to where this is grounded in reality. Obviously, there is, you know, there's a lot of fictional elements to it but uh if somebody who is a practicing catholic reads it they'll be like okay well this guy is either catholic himself or he did his homework Mm -hmm. now taking now taking that into account since you mentioned since you mentioned that a lot of a lot of people tend to tend to get things wrong when it comes to when it comes when it comes to this subject matter um with a Obviously, we don't we don't want to bury anybody anybody here, unless they deserve it. But <laughs> what what would you what would you what, what were some of the what would you say are some of the pet peeves that you've had with pe- with people um, with other people covering this kind of thing that you've noticed with with exorcisms and in, in mainstream comics or indie other indie comics um, in in je- with exorcisms in media period. Let's ca- let's cast the widest net that we can. If you'll let um, me, if you'll let me make a fishing joke, if I'm not, if it, at the risk of sounding too Minnesotan, yeah, I guess I mean, it's one of those things where it, it's kind of like when people are in the military and then they watch movies where it's about the military, they will pick apart every little thing. They'll be like, "Well, his medal is in the wrong place, and and he's got this sort of tab, and he shouldn't have those two together or whatever." So you have to be careful that you just don't act like a weirdo. Um, but when it comes to exorcisms, like I was saying earlier, uh, most of the time they don't even have an actual Catholic priest. It'll just be some guy who, I don't know, I'm just making something up. We'll just say he's like a Wiccan or so. I don't even know what, like whatever. And he's like battling demons and <laughs> casting spells to like, but 
in terms of actual theology, you would just essentially ha- <laughs> it would be somebody that is making use of demonic influences or abilities to essentially, I don't know, it's like mess with other demonic entities. You would just you would just be making the problem worse. So, but that's something where it's like I have to, you know. I'm not going to be watching Doctor Strange on the big screen and saying like, well, actually, uh, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. so I have to step outside and be like, it's fiction, it's fun, you know, and let's not be a killjoy over everything. But I, I guess that was just my main thing is like, there's a, a a serious dearth of actual priests performing exorcisms. And it's like just some guy who... I don't know, for whatever reason, he just doesn't like demons. Well, <laughs> and you're just like that. Okay. This is not, <laughs> this is not legit. I was, I wasn't even, get, I wasn't even going to go with, um with, with Dr. Strange in this, in this particular case, because, well, <laughs> that, that's a, um that's a, ca- that's a can of worms in, on, into, unto itself. But when you mentioned the whole thing of you, of essentially using fire to fight fire, the, the character that immediately came to mind for me personally was um, John Constantine. Right. Although, even that wouldn't be all that strong because um, Constantine is ve- is very aware that he is, that he is constantly playing with fire. Yeah, and so within the Catholic, so in the book, mm-hmm. um, you'll note sometimes there are there's Latin prayers, deliverance prayers. Mm-hmm. If people actually look them up. They'll see that they're, even though the the priests in the book are saying them, in reality they are for the laity. They're act because I don't want. There are certain prayers that only a, a real priest can say. He has the authority to say those prayers, and if somebody who doesn't have the authority says those prayers, like you said, they're playing with serious fire, mm-hmm. and so. Even on that level, so this is like if people don't believe, if they're atheist or agnostic, they could they could enjoy the book for what it is. They could take things as metaphors. It's like we all have our internal demons or whatever, and it's you could get enjoyment out of it. But if you actually start digging into it, then you'll be like, oh, well, he used the prayers for the lady because he didn't. He doesn't want some random reader <laughs> actually using prayers that he's not authorized to use and opening himself up to uh demonic shenanigans i guess well that'll be like the nicest way you could put it uh, mm-hmm. i don't want my own readers playing with spiritual fire yeah i it's it's one of those amusing things because i i remember um i remember a, i remember in, i remember seeing a bunch of articles um when i was do, when i was doing re- when i was doing research on all the tumult that happened after the film the Exorcist um, came came out, i.e. the most cur- i.e. the most cursed fi- the most cursed film that I've that I've had in my library, just be not because not because I was cursed, but because of all the stuff that happened during the filming. I have a story about the, that uh, <laughs> I'll, I could let you know that is really creepy and weird. I like creepy and weird. So I used to live in Washington D.C. and the the Exorcist stairs are nearby. And I had a very good friend who came to visit me and he wa- he was like, we got to see the exorcist stairs. And so we went and we took pictures and he took pictures of himself, like, cr- you know, crawling down the stairs like a demon or whatever. And within a year, my friend, I, I'm, I feel bad even almost recounting the story. He he was in an ATV accident, went over, he broke his neck and he died. And uh, that always freaked me out because we had just gone to the extra i don't know it was just like this you know this 20 how old were we at the time 25 26 27 or something like that like Mm -hmm. goes to the exorcist stairs and in a year later after taking these weird demonic images he breaks his neck and dies and uh so anyway uh that movie maybe there is something to the curse who knows yeah it's it's one there, there's been a, there's been whole documentaries about all about all these strange well, all these strange accidents that happened and I will admit the reason that I end up finding out about those is sometimes with with movies especially bad movies um, 
there's the the story the story behind how a film got made is sometimes more interesting than the than the film itself. Right. Um, obviously, the big example of the, of that is um, Apocalypse Now, which is calling calling that particular production a nightmare is a insult to nightmares. <laughs> yeah. No. It's it's one. It's it's weird how that happens, and with The Exorcist, even. Um, I think it was. I think it was the director was actually invited to the Vatican to see uh, an exorcism take place, and after the fact, he was like, "I'm paraphrasing here, but you mm-hmm. could find the." There's a big article online in one of the British newspapers. I think mm-hmm. he was just like, "I have seen some things that I cannot unsee." <laughs> like he's like, "I've I've seen some stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's pretty freaky." Um, so who knows? Yeah. And I, one of the one of the that brings up one of the other one of the other things that, I, that I was curious about. Um, on the ba- on the back end of the first book, there's there's listed the si- the six forms of, um, demonic activity. Um, was that one was that one of the was that in- was that intended as a kind of rule to, fall to fall back on throughout your writing. So. Not all of the the forms are actually. One of them is actually um, the the subjection was added by Tim as it, it's. So it's based in reality, mm-hmm. but for this fictional world, I gave him the creative license essentially to add a, a sort of like fictional element. So in, in in real life, it would actually be blended into like some of the other forms of demonic activity mm-hmm. um but uh yeah so we, we w- what we wanted to have is sort of like the indiana jones movies where um th- there's a real world element to it but then you have this like fictional stuff that's that's built on top of um like a le- legit theology or mm-hmm. a legit history of of uh, the world or, or whatnot so we're mixing and matching heavily with accurate theology with um a little bit of i don't know our own sort of like fictional add-ons all right i i can i can certainly get i can certainly get that um now speak speaking of speaking of that when when you were when you were setting this thing thing up how did you get how did you get in contact with um lim and and pitch this idea to him uh, so initially, I had my YouTube channel, and I was just making videos. And Tim initially started commenting in the comments section, and I'd always, you know, I at particularly at the time, I tried to reply to pretty much everybody that left a message, and um, so I got to know, know him through there. And then he followed me on Twitter, or maybe I followed him, I don't know. And we started talking on Twitter, um, and I found out that he was. Uh, conservative dude he's also catholic so eventually we started talking on the phone but we weren't even talking about comic books we we're just talking about faith and political stuff and he was telling me about how when he was a kid there was a gi joe contest make your own gi joe and he wanted to come up with like a, a gi joe priest who would who was essentially an exorcist or something along those lines or mm-hmm. would battle cobra's occult uh factions or platoons or whatever and i was like oh well i got this story yada 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 that it essentially would become demons match it sounds like we might be able to work together on something he was like yeah 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 mm-hmm. and I, and then he was he was like just write a script and and send it to me and i was like if you tell me to do this i'm going to do it like i'm not joking around i'm gonna write a script and i'm gonna send it to you and he's like no i'm serious too so I wrote the script and then I flew Mark and Tim were in Orlando for a pseudo vacation slash business thing um, in October. What is it? 2018, maybe. Mm -hmm. And I flew down to Orlando for like a week. I I had to work a couple days while I was there. But then I also we also went around to Disney World. And while we were waiting in lines, we would just talk about the script and go over things and i showed it to him and then tim and mark both liked it and he started working on it soon afterwards yeah 
Now, that br that brings me to the concept of the soul finders, um, which are which I think I think it would be I think it would be um, apropos of me of me to say that if ex if exorcists are analogous to a, to the supernatural police, um, that soul finders would be akin, would be akin to the um, spe the special forces and end of that um, analogy. Um, yeah, most a lot of people have said that that are essentially the special forces of exorcists. Yeah. Uh, what? Um, or were they were they a concept that you want that you wanted to work with or originally, or were or was it something that gradually developed with your t with your talks with um, Lim and uh, Smith? Uh, I I knew I wanted to have the military element in play because I wanted to have physical threats, and I knew that if I that I wanted to build the world in a way where if you have X, so the Catholic church, whether, whether you agree with it or not, or like it or not, you can't deny that it has a very rich history, very fertile ground for storytelling. <laughs> um, and so I was like, okay, so you got the Catholicism in there. You got all the history. If you wanted to get into weird conspiracy stuff, you could get into that, uh, the occult, yada, yada, yada. But then also, if you had the military element into it, then you could bring in the Pentagon. Then you could have weapons. You could have Black Hawk helicopters. You could have, you know, all whatever weapons you want. The saw, you bring, get your M16s in there or whatever. And they could go on missions. And so it just opened up. Then you could get into spy stuff. And that's where Father Redder became Soul Finder 79 that sort of harkens to a, you know, the 007 and spies. And so it's like, you have the military, you have spies, and then you got the magic and the occult and demons and Catholicism and all that. And it's so the the genres that I can play around with, with that, with the soul finder universe, mm -hmm. I can do a intimate little character study, like uh, demons match, or I can just tell a straight up sort of plot driven action adventure story with black tide or i can meld the two and i or i could tell some sort of 1970s sort of conspiracy thriller if i want or i can go into something that's more along the lines of um like we were talking earlier the exorcist although i actually stayed away from the movie and we went out of our way to not try and fall into traps cliches with uh you know exorcism type movies mm -hmm. lord because lord lord knows that particular genre is, has been on a downward spiral for the for the last 20 years <laughs> so yeah it's just one of those things where um i don't know the, the subject matter as a whole just resonates with me and i was like i think it's cool and we'll see what other people like I, there's there's no women in Soul Finder as of yet, so it's just a bunch of dudes. It's about uh, male role models, camaraderie, the importance of strong male role models. So when, even when it comes to marketing, a lot of indie comics will just say they definitely have the the breast factor going on. It's like, I don't have any of that. Um, there's no sex appeal, really. Although I actually do have a lot of women readers. Um so that 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 is interesting the the sort of makeup of the soul finder type readers there's a good mix of of men and women so for whatever reason i think maybe women like uh father redder and father crane and detective chua i don't know mm -hmm. um i've 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 long since taken the taken the approach of don't look a gift horse in the mouth with this kind of thing <laughs> um like you've, the fan base is there, so, uh, so apparently you're doing something right. Yeah, no, I was, I didn't go out of my way to like court any specific audience. So, like I said, I was just, I'm like, I'm gonna do this story. Like, I'm gonna write a comic book that I would want. <laughs> like, if I walked into a comic shop and I saw a Dave Dorman cover with this priest holding a little match or whatever, um, or he's in a, a sinking submarine with a tentacle monster and he's got a Rambo sort of <laughs> knife or something along those lines. Like that's what I would, I would pick it up. And so I, I was really just like, 
I don't know if other people are going to dig this. I don't know if they're going to like it, but this is what I want to read about and uh, we'll see how it goes. And uh, I've been blessed enough to have enough people want to read it to where uh, I at least can make a third book and I'm planning on making a fourth book next, next year. Mm-hmm. Now with, now with that in, with that in mind, um, give, what would you what would you say have been some of the what would you say would have been some of the trickier parts to to implement in in both in both the both the um, story and in the and in just just um just getting the just getting the visuals down right just getting the visuals down right with the with um the, with the first and second comic the th- the things that were a bit more of a struggle than others. Uh, the hardest thing really was. I would say story-wise. So um, the first book, like I said, was very character-driven. It's it's about Patrick Redder and how he goes from just being a, a priest who performs exorcists to accepting his calling to become a soul finder. And so with the second one, I wanted to expand the world. But at the same time, how do you do that when you only have some? So Matt Weldon did the the second book. Mm-hmm. Um, Brett R. Smith came back for colors on on both books, but I only have Matt for so long in the year, and I can't be saying like, "Hey, Matt, I want you to to draw 112 pages for me." So it's like, I I need to expand the world, but I'm only doing one book a year. And I say I want to tell a, a story that's 64 pages or 72 pages, but it's like, well, Matt is a busy, busy guy, and I I can't be greedy because if I'm too greedy, he's gonna not want to work with me again. And he's gonna be like, dude, I can't, you know, I've got other stuff going on. So mm-hmm. I had to be able to expand the world, but also keep the second book to 56 pages. And so I was like setting it up. I was like, okay, well, I have this character, William Neville. He's a bad guy. I want him to be around. I have like a, a larger character arc for this guy. But how, like, how much of his story do I tell? Do do I space it out over the course of three stories? Do I try and see if Matt will just do a seventy-two page story? What do I do? And will people get it that I'm setting the stage for more things, or will they be like, well, I wanted. I wanted Neville's complete backstory in this, you know, this one, Doug. And so there was that. And then also I finished Demon's Match. I was fulfilling it in late October, November, December of, what is it, 2019. Mm-hmm. And then Matt was going to come on and he he needed the script for the second book in April uh, of t- 2020. But there was Christmas, and then I had to go to the Philippines. So then I had to fly to the Philippines for like, I don't know, like a couple of weeks. And then when I was coming back from Manila and Hong Kong, I got some insane virus that knocked me out for like 30 days. So then I was like, I had to get Matt the, the script to the second book. and But the first book I had in my head for like... I don't know, like a year and a half, two years, maybe like a long time. And so, and then black tide, I, I had, I had to push myself a lot faster to both do the research that was necessary. Like I literally had to interview a Navy seal to make sure that uh, our Navy seal veteran Mm -hmm. to make sure certain things were accurate. But then I also had to tell the story. And so I was just mentally exhausted by the time I got Matt the script for Black Tide, so um, I don't know. Those are some of the challenges. Yeah. <clears throat> now, with now, um, Bla- Soul Fi- Soul Finder to to me stri- strikes me as, and maybe maybe this is just me over th- overthinking things because, well, it's what I do. But I did, but I did, I did get a slight tinge of of film noir in some aspects. Um, and if, again, that again that may be that may be me oh, that may be me, me um over reading and things. Well, with the first book, so I grew up reading. I grew up on like Frank Miller Daredevil, basically. Mm-hmm. So it was Spidey, Iron Man, and then like I said, my other brother was a big Daredevil fan, and I would always read his. I always liked the street level 
sort of characters. Yeah. Um, I hated when Spider-Man basically became an Avenger and was like this global sort of whatever. So when I went to Tim, I was like, Tim, I know you have this sort of like anime manga sort of style, but I was wondering if you could tweak it and with Soul Finder, maybe sort of, I don't know, have echoes of Frank Miller Daredevil to it or something along those lines. So uh, it was one of those things where Tim's like, okay, well, this is a challenge for me because I'm going out of my comfort zone. Uh, I want to, so let's see how this goes. I'm going to take this on. So you can tell that Tim's natural style is still there, mm-hmm. but he also was tweaking it to be less anime. Um, and so that was interesting. So I don't know if anything, I, I would say there's definitely daredevil influences, eighties daredevil influence, man, man without fear era. I don't know how much it came through. Um, I can st- in that in that case, I suppose the noir that I was picking up is co- is coincidental, since you look at a lot of Frank Miller's work, and it's clear he's trying very very hard to be, to um to act to echo um to echo stuff like the Long Goodbye, <laughs> um sometimes sometimes more blatant than others. Although it's in, it's interesting that you bring up Frank Miller because. One of the things that he's known for is his use of negative space, and that's that um, isn't as much of a thing here, largely because you're using a full. Um, even though, even though it's, even though as you as you mentioned, it's not it's not it isn't drawn in the style of manga. There's still some bits of DNA of of that in of that in the book. Um, right. But that but because of the fact that you're using that full color palette, it's. A little bit harder to utilize that same kind of negative space, right? And actually, after we had released Soul Finder, um, or as people started seeing art, people wanted just a black and white version of it. it. My wife was actually one of those people as well. She's like, "I just want to see a black and white version of Soul Finder." So for Black Tide, um, did I get you a hardcover or no? I could get you one if I didn't. I don't think I did. I no, you no, I no, you get. You sent you gave me a um, soft cover of both of both of them. Okay, so on the hardcover edition, I actually have uh, Matt Weldon's inks that are behind. It's the exact same story. It's just black and white, mm-hmm. and so that way people were able to compare uh, Matt's inks with Brett R. Smith's and Wes Hartman's. Wes Hartman also helped on color work. Um, just to see how much the colorist adds Mm -hmm. to a book, because I think sometimes the colorist is shortchanged in, in terms of, of credit. So, um, the hardcover edition definitely has just the black and white version of, of of black tide, Mm -hmm. which is, which is certain is certainly, certainly interesting given, given that that's, that's not something that a lot of people will do, will do. They'll either they'll either stick to their guns on do, on doing color or they'll do a black and white approach. Um, um I've had um the one of the pro- one of the projects that's currently in development who who I've ha- that I've had on um regarding Shotgun Samurai, that's that's going to be full on black and white when that comes out, for instance. Nice. Um but with with that kind of thing in mind, um, given the fact that um, Demons Match and Black Tide are two different two different stories stylistically, Bla- um, Demons Match is very is very much a a mystery with hints of noir, and Black T- and Black Tide is f- is far more of a race against time kind of mm-hmm. as you said in, as you said a bit of Indiana Jones um, in it. Is that is that going to be a, is that going to be a theme when it comes to future books that each one of them is going to be a different storytelling style? Um, so with the third book, Infinite Ascent, it, it's almost I, I I essentially learned a lot in terms of writing a comic script on both of them, and that was one of the reasons why I, I wanted to try my hand at something more plot driven for. Mm-hmm for black tide. And I was like, I don't know how people are going to react to this. People might actually hate it. (laughs) So uh, I was like, but I need to be able to sort of play around with these styles as I'm learning about comic scripting. So the third story, if I do my job correctly, 
will actually be a melding of the two. I'm hoping to have the sort of emotional resonance mm -hmm. that was there with uh, Demon's Match and Father, the very personal story with Father Redder, but also have the action and adventure of, of Black Tide. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully this will be the best one. I don't know. I, I, it's, it's weird to me how people will like each book. Like some people are like, well... Uh, this book is technically better here, but I actually like the story better. And I don't know. It's cool to see people that are that they like one over the other and sort of like bounce it back and forth, whether which one is actually better. Mm -hmm. And when it comes when it, since you mentioned that that book is going is going to be a combination of what came before. Um, how do you make sure to keep that keep those particular plates spinning and keep those? And keep them balanced, if you if you don't mind the analogy. Yeah, it was that's weird that you mentioned that. I literally was just telling someone the other day that um, when it comes to the pros, a lot of the pros they just need to write a script and they turn it in and they're done. Then it's off to somebody else. But if you're an indie comics guy, you're like the guy in the variety show spinning all of these plates because you're the you're the marketing guy and you're the director and you got to do the accounting and all this sort of stuff. So. Um, it was fitting that you mentioned the the, the plate you're probably also analogy. The, you're probably also the sound guy playing playing um, a rendition of Saber Dance in the background. Yeah. So um, no, but for each story, it, it's basically I start with like a theme that I want to explore, and from that theme, so like the the first book was why do bad things happen to good people, and then the second book, in many ways. Um, I wanted to explore again, the, the quote unquote abyss, which was a, a metaphor for anxiety and depression mm -hmm. and regret. And, and basically, basically when people it's hell, I, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, but just those low points that we could all find our, ourselves in. So I start with a theme and then it's like, and then I'll start reading books that I haven't read before. But I'm like, oh, I, I've always wanted to read that book and it covers this theme. And so then I start getting my mind. That's my research um, for the story. And then as I'm reading these books on the themes that I want to explore, ideas will just start coming to me. And then the story takes shape as I start doing the research around the theme. So I don't I mean, I, on some level with the third book, I was like, OK, I want to try and meld both together because I don't know. I, I like, like I was saying, I like the freedom that the property gives me to be able to hopscotch or, you know, switch back and forth between the, the intimate character studies and then the action and, and adventure. But I think I'm at my best if I'm doing more character studies or, or focusing much more on individual characters and their personal struggle struggles, um, that sort of thing. Um, but I, like I said, I wanted to be able to show that I could write action and adventure at the same time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, when, now given, given the setup with, with black tide, what, um, I know that I know that you mentioned dipping into themes of themes of depression, but what pro what prompted you to go with um to go with the ocean? Um, let me. So initially, for whatever <laughs> the abyss, I, I was I thought of this the character William Neville, who's this um, nuclear submariner or former nuclear submariner, and I was like that would be interesting if you actually had this nuclear submariner and he spends his time going into the abyss but then somewhere along the line he he thinks about okay well what about if i tried to plumb the depths of the human soul and the human psyche and go into those depths of that sort of abyss or or something like that and so it just it felt like the sea was a natural fit for i don't know the themes of depression and anxiety and all, all that sort of stuff. And then from there, I started thinking about um, one of my favorite movies, if not my favorite movie of all time is Jaws. And so uh, I was like, okay, well, I like the idea of also being um, alone in this 
wide open space where you're like in the middle of nowhere, like sort of like this feeling of dread that could come about when you're just this tiny speck uh, in the middle of nowhere. But then also the fear that comes when maybe you're in a claustrophobic place as well. So in Black Tide, they're in the middle of the ocean, but then they're like, you know, at the bottom of the ocean and then they're inside. Uh, I don't want to give too much away or whatever, but let's like, there's all sorts of different sorts of fear that alternates between um, being in enclosed spaces, but then also wide open spaces simultaneously. Yeah. And, and either, either way you're in as a, as a core rule with thumb, with any sort of horror, you're in a place that you shouldn't be. Um, like when you're when you're yelling when you're yelling at the scre- when you're yelling at the screen, don't go in there. You're gonna get yourself killed. That's a horror movie doing its job. Uh. Right, and and with this one, I, I, I really wanted there to just be this overall sense of dread and fear. That's like you can't really put your finger on it always, but it's there. Or if you start thinking about it, it's there. Um, but I was like, I don't know how people are gonna react to that because the the bad guy, the villain is just this overall the heaviness of this sense of dread this fear Mm -hmm. and like i said the the villain is the spirit of depression and anxiety and regret and all this sort of stuff it's not really like a person it's not like someone you could just point to and i was like i don't know how people are going to react to this where it's really about this overall feeling more than a person or a specific sort of demon. Obviously the demon is there, but the story as a whole, um, it, it's more about an overall spirit. Mm-hmm. And what would you, what would you say were, were some of the big um, learning experiences from, 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 um, do, from creating book two? From creating book two? Mm-hmm. Like I said, it was it was a challenge to be able to tell a self-contained tale that also expanded the universe at the same time and was setting the stage for something else. So I wanted to give people something that could be satisfying in and of itself where they don't even need to read Demon's Match if they don't if, if they didn't, if they just went into Black Tide. It's like, I mean, I would strongly advise reading the first one, but if they didn't, they don't need to. Um, but it, like I said, I had this character in William Nebel where I want to go back and it's really a three part story arc where it's a man in the 1980s gives into despair. And then in present time in Black Tide, you see the effect years later of the ma- of a man who is lost in despair. He's become one with it. He's lost in the abyss. So that's part two. And then part three is coming along the way as well, where it'll be what happens when essentially love and despair clash versus one another. Can that man be brought back out of the abyss? So what I want to do ultimately is tell a tale in the 1980s with Father Crane, the initial search for William Nebel. Mm -hmm. Then you have the the Black Tide. And then ultimately um, I will tell... I don't want to spoil too much, but there will be a final confrontation between William Nebel and at least one of the soul finders. Uh, and we will see what happens with, with that character. Yeah. And with the, with that kind with that kind of thing in mind, um, what are you, what are you shooting for as far as a release window, not a release date, because I know how these things can be in flux, but a release window for book three. Uh, Infinite and Ascent is well underway. It's seventy. The story is seventy-two pages. So uh, I, I, I owe Matt quite a few steak dinners or something. <laughs> um, and he's done with at least thirty-six in terms of. He's done all the pencils and he's done a number of inks. My guess is I know he's got another batch he's got to turn in. So he's probably done with inking like twenty pages. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's a fast worker, but then he also has, there's a 12 page short story um, titled war cry, 
that uh, he's also doing that takes place at Arlington Cemetery. So it's a good question. I think we might be able to get it done by the end of the year, but I'm really just going to take my time and... Um, so if we want to do a hardcover, the hardcovers actually take a lot of planning. And mm. then you have to, once you figure out what you want to do, then we have to figure out which plant uh, with API print productions is going to do it. They have multiple plants and some are better suited for what I would want than others. So it's like, you got to figure out what you want to do with the hardcover. Then you got to figure out which plant's going to do it. And, um, and then you got to figure out when they can do it because they might have a whole bunch of other orders. So my guess is it'll either be very late this year for the third one or January, February next year. Uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Uh, Brett R. Smith is doing the colors on war cry mm-hmm. um, unless his schedule changes. And then Matt's, uh, normal colorist on punchline that which he does with bill williams mm-hmm. is actually going to do the main story yeah and in lieu of in lieu of not jinxing you because i do not want to tempt the gods of irony <laughs> look just in, just in case just in case <laughs> look think i i guess it, as i as i said in the past i've 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 worked. I've worked. I've worked in. An, I've worked in an insurance agency at one point. So, risk prevention is risk prevention and assessment is one of those habits. <laughs> oh. Well, the good the good thing about Black Tide was it wasn't crowdfunded. So mm-hmm. we just released it when it was done. It was boom. You could order it on a Monday, and you could have it possibly on a Wednesday. Um, yeah. And so Infinite Ascent is going to be the same way. I don't plan on crowdfunding. It's It'll just be re- released directly to Iconic Comics again. So in that sense, I'm able to essentially I don't, preview more art in the buildup because I know that as soon as the book is done, I don't have a 30 or 60 day campaign on top of that. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I'm not as... Um, paranoid about when exactly it'll come out because I know I don't I'm not going to do the crowdfunding this time although when I do another IP um, down the line there's a couple more that I want to develop the new one will probably be crowd crowdfunded at least on the first first round to see how that goes mm-hmm. and speak um, speaking up speaking of that what what could what is What's your what is your assessment in retrospect on doing crowdfunding that for that first time for um Demon's Match? Crowdfunding was huge. That I mean, I wouldn't have been able to just go directly to Iconic this time around without the crowdfunding because essentially I had to gauge okay, well, how many people uh purchased the first book? How many what percentage of those people will I be able to retain when I send out an email to, you know, an Indiegogo email to those people? Will I be able to retain 80%, 90%, 50%? What what, what will it be? And so I had to sort of take an educated guess and take a calculated risk and say like, okay, I think if, if I just sent out the email to these people and said, Hey, go to iconic that I'll be able to get enough people where it'll make financial sense Mm -hmm. and i'm not totally going to shoot myself in the foot basically um on this so i needed crowdfunding to at least get that initial mailing list of people that were would be interested in the second soul finder book and so between the indiegogo mailing list and then iconic comics own mailing list that has been built up over the past couple years i was like i think Mm -hmm. I, i really only care about making enough money to where I can make the next book. I don't need to be a millionaire. I don't need to, (laughs) I don't need to make hundreds of thousands of dollars. I just need to make enough to make the next book and make it um, how I want to make it. You know, if I want to do a hardcover with gilded edges and little red ribbons, like it's a Bible or something like that, I want to be able to do that. And so that's all I care about. And so I took that calculated risk, and uh, it paid off. Well, you you already you already pushed the you already pushed the whole idea of 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 gimmick merchandise as it was when you with the um, rosary. 
Yeah, there was another one where some, some uh, well-meaning people kind of looked at me like I had three heads. Uh, they were like, what, a rosary? Like, you know, Usually you do like a, a card, like I did with Demon's Match, or mm -hmm. do some stickers or something, man. But I wanted to do something that was both tied to the actual Soul Finder universe, but also practical uh, for people that are practicing Catholics or just Christians that uh, are feel comfortable saying the rosary um, in general, because maybe 30 years from now, there'll be someone's kid or grandkid who stumbles upon the rosary. They don't know anything about soul finder, uh, but it's a rosary and they could use it if they want. And so a lot of, I, they sold really well. Uh, we, we probably have like, I don't know, like 12 left on the iconic store and then I got to go back to rugged rosaries and order uh, more, but it, it takes a long time to make them. Mm -hmm. And with with that in mind, I'll I'll certainly be looking forward to to the um, to the net, to the books that are going to be coming. And I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule, it, and. Um, and braving and braving the nightmare of time zones to come all the way up to the temple. <laughs> no, man, uh, I just really appreciate that you uh, reached out and were willing to read the books and then have an intelligent conversation on crowdfunding and storytelling and comics and the books in general. So thank you for for that. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to whether it's to further discuss Soulfinder. To to discuss about to discuss about some about old school Mar old school Marvel in DC, or just or just to la just to laugh at the eternal misery of Cubs fans, the door is always open. <laughs> Sounds good, man. As I, I appreciate often, it. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> you never know. Mm -hmm. On rare occasions, I, I will. I will have a drink or two and of course a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness and there'll be plenty more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet but until then on behalf of the good brothers present and not present my name is mildra i am your gaming monk stay frosty everybody